everyone. And I'm excited to see everyone online, even though I can't actually see you. I hear you. All right, so today we have a few announcements. First of all, for our new Demography and Aging seminar class uh, that our doctoral students are signed up for, this is a reminder to sign in online. Okay, our second announcement is that uh, we have several uh, diversity fellowship program uh, uh, projects this summer that we are funding and are, are being funded by different research projects. Uh, we will be hiring uh, several graduate students and undergraduate students uh, for the summer period, either uh, 10 weeks or eight weeks, uh, 20 hours per week. Um, and this is a great experience to be mentored on a team of researchers to obtain professional mentorship and professional development over the summer and to get paid. So if you are a graduate student uh, or an undergraduate uh, who is interested in research and working on one of these projects, please come to our website for more information here. All right, now we're going to hand off the microphone to Claire, who has an announcement. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to say that on Friday mornings, if you find grant writing tedious and annoying, um, join us from uh, I think it's 9 30 to noon is what I said it was going to be on zoom and I will be there and if you want my feedback on your specific aims or some ideas I'm happy to hop into a breakout room with you I recruited incredible other people to join me in hosting and Liz Boyle will be here this Friday as well which is awesome so you don't just hear my perspective and um, it's a way to make it slightly more fun to do something that can be tedious as grant writing. We had a whole conversation this morning in my writing group about making things more fun. So this is one of the ideas. There's also an accountability feature, which you can sign up to commit. And there's going to be a special email list for the committed people. And you'll have to email us if you can't make it as an accountability feature and say why. And that is just an extra level of accountability. So uh, join us if that's every other week. And uh, first one is this Friday. It's on our calendar. Great. Thank you, Claire. All right. So it is my pleasure today to welcome Andy Fenelon, uh, who is giving our talk today. Andy is an associate professor in the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health at the University of Minnesota here. Um, he's a demographer and population health scientist interested in the social and policy determination uh, determinants of health. Specifically, he studies how housing policy can improve health and well-being and reduce inequalities across the life course. Uh, he just arrived to the U last summer, and before coming to the U, Andy was an assistant professor of public policy and sociology at Penn State. He has a PhD in sociology from the University of Pennsylvania and a BA in geography from the University of California, Santa Barbara. So it is my honor to give Andy and bestow upon you the demography Minnesota demography and aging mug which you can only receive by virtue of presenting in this seminar series congratulations and let's welcome him here today uh, you know since uh Heather Randell my my spouse gave a talk last semester there has been one of these in our household but I've been um forbidden to use it and and quite jealous and until now um, so we better keep them separate. Uh, so th thanks everyone for, for coming on what turns out to be a relatively warm day. Um, the, uh, the coldest temperatures I've ever experienced were about a week ago. Um, and I never thought that I would become one of those Minnesota people that starts to flex about the winter, but man, today it's so nice. Um, yeah, so I, I just got here over the summer. Um, and I feel like it's just in the past few weeks that I don't feel new anymore. Like I feel like now I've been here and this is my place and I'm a Minnesota person. Um, and, and I'm sure that will, you know, I'll feel more and more like that as time goes on. Um, but I'm really happy to be here and thank you all for, for coming to the first one of the semester. Uh, today I, I'm talking about um, housing assistance programs and uh, lead exposure. And it's part of a broader project. Um, focused on housing assistance and environmental risk exposures uh, broadly. Um, and my subtitle to this is, it's not, it's not in the paper, um, because you probably couldn't say this in a journal, but it, is public housing actually that bad? 
Uh, and you could be forgiven if your um, impression is that public housing is uniquely bad housing situation that exposes people to all sorts of negative uh, outcomes and negative uh, determinants to, to long-term health and well-being. So I, I do want to acknowledge the, the research team um, here, especially Mizang Chu, who uh, wrote the first draft of this paper. She's the first author. She was the postdoc on, on this grant um, and now is a faculty member at Tufts. Uh, Ami Zota, the PI, and Gary Adamkowicz at, at Harvard. And this is funded by uh, a grant from HUD, of all places. They have uh, a grant program to fund studies of uh, the effects of their programs on, on health. And this was a, a perfect uh, fit. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. I, I'm, I'm not going to first talk about housing. I'm first going to talk about lead, um, why it's bad, what we know about it, and, and then kind of how that leads into talking about housing. And I'm going to talk about public housing, uh, which is the most charismatic of the existing housing programs. But I'm also going to talk about the, the other programs. I'm also going to talk kind of broadly about how, how we think about housing and health and, and where the, the lead question fits into that, that broader literature. Um, and hopefully it'll become clear that it's really, really hard to study this kind of question with existing data. Um, and that in order to do this effectively, we need data sets that are linked together. We need to capitalize on, uh, on the value of existing data by, by merging multiple data sources. I'll talk about my approach, um, what I find, and then I'm going to end sort of with how, how I think we can take a more critical approach to media attention surrounding public housing programs. Um, and that's, I, I would say, if, if there is one main takeaway from what I talk about today, th this, this is it. And hopefully that, that'll become clear because I'll talk about it quite a lot. Um, but it's something that I, I really want people to, to take away from a, a lot of this work in general, not just the, the specific piece. All right, so lead. Now, lead is really bad. And I probably don't have to convince anybody in this room about how and why lead is really bad. This is something that probably most people have, if not firsthand experience with, then, then secondhand experience. They probably read a lot about it. Um, but lead has a lot of negative effects. And, and I could go through an entire hour long talk about lead and not cover all of the the empirically based negative effects of lead on, on people. And, and I would argue it's one of the biggest policy errors we made in the 20th century. Right? And that, that's a big statement for the United States of America, which uh, was maybe not a functioning democ democracy for the majority of the 20th century, where we, um, we gave you Jim Crow, the Vietnam War, um, the heaviest smoking population in, in world history. Um, but lead, I mean, I'd say falls under one of these categories because we've known for a long time lead has negative effects. We didn't quite get it out of all of our products until, well, maybe not even now. And although we know that lead exposure permanently damages kids' brains, there's also been recent work highlighting the fact that the effects of lead are not limited to children. There, there's, there's a lot of very convincing um, uh, analytical approaches that demonstrate that lead exposure actually has negative effects on, uh, on adult health and well-being. And it's important to recognize that although historically, right, in the United States, lead was everywhere. It was in the air, it was in the water, it was in the soil, it was on our toys, it was uh, in our food. Um, but the contemporary sources of lead exposure are largely residential, right? We're mostly being exposed to lead nowadays through where we live, um, both in terms of the physical structure of our housing as well as our neighborhood. Now, lead is really bad. And at various times, we've been told that certain levels of lead are OK. Um, now, you would hope that the safe level of lead would have stayed pretty constant, you know, based just in terms of uh, the physical science surrounding the effects of lead on the human body. But of course, it hasn't. At various times, we've been told that differing levels of lead are OK. Um, and then now it's really only in the past few years that the CDC sort of said there, there's actually no safe level of lead exposure. Any, any amount of lead is worse than no lead. But you know, still to have some kind of cutoff, people like to remember numbers. Um, levels above three and a half micrograms per deciliter um, will often require follow-up with clinicians. So if you go in and your blood lead level is above that, you, 
they, they, they might recommend some, uh, some changes. And it's important to rec recognize that the, the level of exposure to, to lead matters, right? So your, your, blood, your blood blood level in absolute terms matters, but the length of, it, length of exposure also matters. So if you're exposed consistently to, to high lead for many, many years, that's going to uh, be particularly deleterious to your um, short and long-term health. And there, there was this great piece a couple of years ago um, in PNAS by folks at Florida State, Mike McFarlane and um, what's his name, Matt Hauer, um, looking at the sort of historical uh, trajectory of lead in US cohorts. Um, and they used historical data measuring lead and looked at kind of the, the fraction of each cohort that would have experienced at some time an elevated blood lead level above five, five micrograms per, per deciliter. Um, and one, one, you know, good, uh, one positive to take away from this is that we've actually been very successful at reducing people's blood lead level, right? It's not as if we've done nothing. It's not as if this is a persistent problem. Like we, we actually learned that this was an issue. It maybe took a little bit longer than it should have, but we, we actually got there, that, that blood levels have come down. However, in uh, 1966 through 1980, is that a generation? I forget. Um, blood lead levels were exceptionally high. Essentially 100% of people born in these years had early life blood lead levels, what, what would be considered elevated today. Um, I, I'm born in 1985, so I'm right on this like rapid decline in, in elevated blood lead levels. So maybe I'm one of the lucky ones, but if you were born between 1966 and 1980, um, you probably weren't. I, I'm not saying this. This is I'm, I'm just quoting this paper. Um, now, nowadays, kids' blood lead levels are much lower. Um, the The chance of a kid experiencing elevated blood lead is much much lower than it has been. However, and I'll get to this in a second. There there are large disparities in who actually experiences this. And you know, it, it's one thing to say that 100% of people had elevated blood lead. But it's also really important to understand that it's not just that people had above five micrograms. The, about half of lots of those cohorts were in what we would consider kind of danger zones of getting close to, to lead poisoning or getting close to, to extremely negative long-term effects. Um, the average blood lead level for, for the people who were in their early 40s in 2015 is uh, around 22 micrograms per, per deciliter. Uh, and if you came in and that was your blood lead level on a test, um, there would be some uh, emergency responses. Now, we know that elevated lead exposure is associated with a ton of both short-term and long-term negative outcomes, right? So it's not just that you are at risk of dying of lead poisoning, there are also longer-term effects. So it's been implicated in digestive diseases, inflammatory conditions, cardiovascular disease, respiratory conditions, and, and even dementia. Um, and then beyond health, the, uh, lead exposure has also been implicated in cognitive effects as well as behavioral effects. Um, and there was a fantastic paper from folks uh, at MPC uh, a couple of years ago, Mark Lee, who's no longer here, but including Rob Warren, um, using a really, really, really unique uh, approach where they linked people to their 1940 census location they looked at um, where lead pipes existed in the United States and matched that with the pH of water to know who, who was actually getting lead into their blood from water and found that people who were exposed to, to lead had worse cognitive scores up to, um, to 70 to 80 years later. Um, and and the, the difference is pretty substantial. So this is something that, that affects people in the long term, not just the short term. Um, there's also a, you know, a controversial theory that lead exposure is also related to, to violent crime in the United States, rises and falls. It matches up pretty well if you just move cohorts about 20 years into the future. I'm not sure I totally buy this, um, but I, I just wanted to demonstrate kind of how far the, the negative effects of lead potentially go. As I said before, you're mostly getting exposed to lead now through where you live. So, Modern sources of lead exposure, are, uh, we've mostly done a great job of getting lead out of the air because it used to be in gasoline, now it's not. Um, the unfortunate thing is a lot of the lead that used to be in the air is now in the soil. Um, it's also still in the water, as we saw with Flint, Michigan. 
um, and a lot of other similar cases that didn't, didn't get quite as much media attention. Um, it's in paint in, in most structures in the United States. Um, and it, if, you're, if your building is built before 1977, there's almost certainly some, some lead in the paint. And then also the dust, either from construction in your neighborhood, construction in your home, um, or from just general weathering of, uh, of older paint uh, or soil. Now, in thinking about housing, how housing fits into this, there, there's this generalized uh, sort of uh, approach to, to linking housing to health um, that has this very, very kind of cute four C's approach that housing affects your health through four C's, costs, how much, uh, whether you can afford it, your affordability, consistency, how stable your access to housing is, conditions, the, the quality of your, your housing and um, whether it's overcrowded, and then context, the, the structure, the socioeconomic and, and physical structure of, of your neighborhood. Now, it's pretty clear that the relationship between housing and lead exposure is gonna fall largely under conditions, under, under quality. And so I do, I do wanna take a quick aside to talk about that, right? Historically, in the United States, housing quality has been relatively poor, at least poor compared to what we, what we think about now. And it was the major focus of research. So when we're talking about how housing affects your health, historically, what most people thought of was whether or not your house was in good condition, because it, it many, in many cases was not. Um, today, quality concerns are much less prevalent. That's a good thing. We've improved housing quality on the average quite a bit. And affordability is now the primary concern. When you have about half of renters having difficulty affording their housing, that's of course gonna get more attention. But what, what that means is that there's a lot less research on housing quality and health, even though it remains a really important disparity mechanism, right? So who experiences poor quality housing in the United States is now no longer everybody. Now it's really disadvantaged households that, ha that often have to trade housing quality for affordability. And so moving into to housing assistance programs like public housing, the question is how bad is public housing, right? So when, when talking about housing quality, when talking about lead, how bad is public housing? And, and if you were to read the New York Times, which maybe many of us do, um, the answer that you would come away with is pretty bad. Public housing is really bad for you. Uh, this is just a smattering of articles. This is certainly not exhaustive of what showed up in the New York Times in the past few years. Um, just a flurry of articles talking about the New York City Housing Authority, um, the public housing program more generally, and uh, how bad it is. I mean, it, it, it's exposed, and, and these are real concerns. So not, not to detract from these, right? Like the, this means that people who are living in government supported housing are being exposed to all sorts of quality concerns that we, generally think are um, unacceptable. But this is a lot of coverage. And I understand, right, that the, the New York Times role, at least part of it, is to you know, speak truth to, to government programs that, that might be shirking their responsibility to improve the lives of the citizenry. Um, but there, there's a lot of focus on it. So I, I, do, I do just want to point out that, that this, this, is, this is heavily covered. In the history of the public housing program, things didn't always look this way, right? So at the outset of the program during the New Deal in the 1930s, um, the government constructed a, a fair number of public housing developments in, in cities, most, mostly in the Eastern United States. Uh, we got one, uh, Sumner Field, and these are just examples of, of other developments during this time. Uh, Ryan Allen, Dave Van Riper have done a ton of awesome work on, on this topic. It's something that is really hard to study, they, they've um, really had the upper hand in identifying some of the, the social and economic characteristics of, of families who were living in these public housing developments. Um, and the interesting thing is that during this time, the public housing program was not focused on the poor. Right? The, they, the, these developments were geared towards what was called the submerged middle class. So middle class families who were in kind of the, the middle tertile of income expected to benefit strongly from, from support from the government for housing that would lead to upward mobility. Um, and it, you know, it, in some ways partially to match that, the quality of construction was exceptional. Um, so 
you might not find these buildings all that beautiful. I do. I think these are absolutely fantastic. And they have stood the test of time, literally. Most of these buildings are still around, still being used as public housing. Um, this guy right here, Sumner Field, no longer here. But, uh, but the vast majority of these early public housing developments are, are still serving that function. Moving into the middle of the 20th century, the 1950s to 1970s, public housing looked a little bit different, as did who it was oriented towards. So starting in about 1949, public housing was geared towards the poor. Um, and in fact, it, it was required that a certain fraction of residents in public housing had to be uh, designated as, as very low income. And the, the physical and architectural structure changed as well, right? So you have high density project towers, in some cases, not particularly well integrated into surrounding neighborhoods. Um, the architecture is also very recognizable. Um, this is an example from, these are both famous examples, one from Chicago and one from St. Louis. And, and one thing that's different here, other than the, the fact that the quality of construction was significantly lower than it had been, as well as the population that it was serving was much, uh, much poorer, most of these projects are gone. Both Robert Taylor Homes and Pruitt Igo were demolished. Um, Pruitt Igo only stood for maybe 20 years. Uh, Robert Taylor Homes was demolished in uh, the 2000s. But, but it, it, it's really interesting to contrast that with what was happening beforehand. In the 21st century, public housing also looks very different. There's been much less public housing construction in the past several decades. Um, and I'll get to, to what, that in a second. But these are just some examples of newer public housing developments. One here, the Minnehaha townhomes, which is on the same land as Sumner Field in, uh, in North Minneapolis, and Rainier Vista, which is in uh, South Se Seattle. And of course, they look very different. There's an architectural shift as well. There's much better integration into surrounding neighborhoods. Um, the density is also much lower, and there, there's not as much recognizable architecture here. So as I said, public housing is the most charismatic, right? It's, it's what you think of when you think of housing assistance in the United States. Uh, but it's, it, it's one of only several, of several programs. And in fact, it's not the largest. Um, so public housing uh, is specifically government-owned housing developments that are provided to assisted families uh, at affordable rates. But there's been much more emphasis on tenant-centered programs like Housing Choice Vouchers. Housing Choice Vouchers gives families uh, a certificate that they can use to rent uh, a unit in, in the private market. Um, they pay up to 30% of their income, and the difference between that and the rent is subsidized by, by the voucher. And in theory, right, this gives families a little bit more flexibility about where to live, um, but there are also some constraints. Multifamily housing is a, another set of programs where the government subsidizes units in privately owned developments uh, as long as they remain at affordable levels for, uh, for assisted families. So how are these programs related to quality? Well, assisted housing units have to meet particular quality standards. So, and, and they're done, this is done through, through regular inspection. So voucher units, when a tenant receives a voucher and moves into a unit, the units are inspected prior to move in, and then uh, usually annually after that, although there's a lot of variation at the local level. Um, public housing units are inspected every few years, and they actually receive a score uh, called REAC from, from HUD. Uh, and so any, any issues that, are, that arise during the inspection have to be remitted. Um, and an important thing to understand here is that it's not just that housing assistance itself uh, uh, requires, requires inspection that is related to quality. It's also that low-income families, those who would qualify for these programs, are very often sacrificing housing quality for affordability. So in, in order to afford the type and size of unit they want, they're often has, having to go to either um, very low-quality housing or, um, or neighborhoods where um, where they're exposed to other sorts of, of risks. And so housing assistance, I mean, even beyond the inspection piece, allows families to afford better housing than they would be able to otherwise. Okay, so studying this, this question of how, how housing assistance 
and access to housing assistance affects your exposure to lead is challenging um, because if we're using if we're using most data sets we're just not finding that many individuals who are receiving housing assistance this is not a super large population only about 10 million people nationwide uh, and so most most data systems that are going to have a lot of the information that we care about are going to have pretty small samples sometimes what researchers have done have is to use information from a particular city and so they have much more extensive data from a particular geography but then that limits us because things vary quite a bit across the united states when we get into larger nationwide data systems where we're, we're finding enough uh, enough people who are receiving housing assistance we're often dealing with self-reports of whether somebody is participating in a program and that's fine i mean they like it we, we use a lot of self-reports of a program participation this one appears to be particularly bad um that, that some some work that some of my colleagues and i have done have shown that about half of people living in public housing report that they're not receiving any any assistance with their their housing and it's not necessarily it's not not necessarily that that's wrong it's that it, it's not very useful for um for what we want to do with it and then there's self-reports of outcomes right and so it, this is both a positive and a negative. I mean, in a lot of cases, we, we, we want self-reports of outcomes because that, that's going to get us closer to what we're looking at. But for lead, that's probably not going to be OK. People don't know what their lead level is. Even if you ask a question like, has a doctor ever told you that you have elevated blood lead, that, that's going to be um, very problematic in terms of who's actually had their, their blood lead taken. And then the final one is selection bias. Um, people who are receiving housing assistance are just very different than those who are not receiving housing assistance on a lot on a lot of different dimensions because it, re it requires that you have a certain income level that you need assistance that you're able to navigate the stygian bureaucratic processes in order to access it it just means that there's going to be a lot of differences between between these groups and another important thing to understand is that it's not actually that easy to get access to housing assistance. So unlike a lot of other safety net programs in the US, housing assistance is not an entitlement, uh, by which I mean that just qualifying for the program doesn't mean you get it. Uh, there's a severe shortage of available units relative to the number of eligible families. Um, and so what that means is that families have, have to wait years to actually access a unit once they, once they apply. Um, the average wait time is two years, uh, but it can be substantially longer um, in, in some cities, like upwards of, of 10 years. And at that point, it's not clear what the, what the real benefit is. All right, so returning to what I'm looking at here, I, I'm studying the effect of housing assistance programs on lead exposure. And then I'm also interested in the public housing piece, right? Do, does this effect differ by housing program? Focusing on public housing, housing choice vouchers, and, and multifamily housing. Now, as I made clear before, this requires linked data. And so I'm, I'm linking data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey and Haines, which some of you may be familiar with, um, and HUD administrative records. So HUD maintains this daily updated administrative record of who is receiving HUD housing assistance. They have all sorts of information on when, when people are entering and exiting the programs. Um, really valuable, and the, these two data sets are, are linked. Now, there are three major strengths to using this data source. The first is measured blood lead. So NHANES is super unique in that it sends an examination um, truck, I guess you, you would call it, out to, to where it's collecting data. People go into this um, mobile examination unit. They have blood taken. They get measurements. Um, and so we have a lot of you know, measured uh, information about their, their health and, and blood lead is one. The second is administrative data on HUD participation. So we know directly from HUD records whether someone is receiving housing assistance at any given time. And the third is that we have information on program entry and exit dates. And that, that's important because we, we don't just know whether someone is receiving housing assistance. We also know when and when they're going to start if they haven't yet. So this is kind of how, how the linkage works. We have NHANES here on the bottom. We have the HUD administrative record, which runs for 20 uh, years. And then once we have information uh, to identify participants, we can link them across these, these data systems. Um, 
And so we, we can link someone even if they have already exited HUD housing by the time that they're interviewed by Ann Haynes. We can link people who have multiple episodes of HUD assistance. And then, of course, we can also link people who are receiving HUD assistance at the time that, that N. Haynes comes to interview them. I'm using two, two measures of blood lead. Um, one is just the, the continuous blood lead level um, in geometric mean form, so it's logged, uh, it, so it's micrograms per, per deciliter. And then a, a dichotomous measure of elevated blood lead, which is 3.5 micrograms per deciliter or above. Um, and you know, thankfully, because we've been pretty successful at reducing blood lead in the United States, the, this is a lower level than even what, what um, some measures use as elevated blood lead, which is five. Uh, and there just weren't enough folks in, in the survey above that. Uh, we're also focusing on individuals six years and older. And that's because this question has already been pretty, pretty well answered uh, for younger kids. Um, so there, there's a, a study by some of my former colleagues at the National Center for Health Statistics uh, looking at housing assistance and blood lead levels in, in kids one to five. Um, now, they didn't look at, it, at differences across programs, and they used a slightly different approach from what we're, we're using. But I, I think that they're, they're finding that housing assistance is, is reducing kids' blood lead levels um, means that it, it, it's important to focus on the rest of the age span. All right, so the analytical approach. As I said before, right, housing assistance is not randomly assigned, right? Like you, there, there's not um, a random group of people and you assign them to receive it or not receive it. Um, that, that would be amazing for research purposes, but it's just not how it works. Those who receive housing assistance are different from those who don't in a ton of ways. Um, and a, a ton of ways. So this, this is three, three sorts of examples that, you know, HUD-assisted adults um, report worse self-rated health, more complex activity limitations, the even poor educational attainment, um, and not just then the rest of the population who's not receiving assistance. Even when you look just at low-income renters, um, you know, the, sort of the population that would potentially be eligible for, for HUD assistance, um, they're still looking significantly worse. And for kids, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing, you know, similar effects that it, it's not just that adults have lived a hard life. Um, there's just a lot of selection here. So when, when we compare kids' mental health who are receiving assistance to those who are not, we see much worse mental health for, for kids in, in HUD housing. Um, and so if we, were, if we were to do this kind of naive comparison of people receiving HUD housing to those who are not, we're mostly going to conclude that HUD housing is bad for you. Um, but I'm not sure that that's warranted because there are just there are a lot of things that are selecting people into into housing assistance. And I, it's important to recognize that we'd likely not be able to statistically adjust for these differences using controls. I mean, there are just too many potentially unobserved differences here um, that are leading to, to some, I mean, some of these differences, right, that just controlling for, for a few characteristics is not going to be enough. So this is where the wait list becomes valuable, right? So folks who are having to wait two years to receive housing assistance, that's bad. It's tragic for those families because they, they need stable housing and they're, they're having to wait years. But it does create the conditions that we can use to, um, to identify a suitable comparison group. Um, and so this is sort of a, a stylized comparison between someone currently receiving assistance at their interview and somebody who is in a, a wait list category, so someone who is not not receiving assistance when they're interviewed, but who will within a particular, a particular period in the future. Um, and my cutoff here is two years. That's about the average wait time. Um, and so if we, if we were to compare individuals receiving housing assistance to those not receiving assistance, we're going to see huge differences. That those receiving housing assistance are going to be substantially more likely to be non-Hispanic Black, have less than a high school education, uh, be in extreme poverty, to not be employed. Um, and these differences are, are enormous. And th this, is, this is part of what, why I say it's going to be very difficult to just con control away those differences. But now when we replace this comparison group with the waitlist, the characteristics look very similar. Right? So all, all of a sudden, instead of comparing to everybody else, now we're comparing to people who will, in the future, in the near future, 
be receiving housing assistance. Okay, so the, these are the models uh, predicting the two outcomes. This is comparing those currently receiving housing assistance to those in the waitlist group. Um, in terms of blood lead, we're seeing uh, an 11 and percent decline in blood lead level for those receiving assistance compared to the waitlist. Okay, that, that's good news. It might not seem that big, just a 12% decline in blood lead. But we're seeing a pretty substantial reduction in the fraction um, who have elevate, elevated blood lead, so three and a half micrograms per deciliter or above. And, and the effect here is pretty substantial. So we're seeing about a halving of the population who is in the, um, the elevated blood lead group um, among those receiving current, current assistance compared to the wait list. Okay, and then looking at differences uh, across programs, this is where we're really gonna get into to the meat of, well, so what, what exactly is going on here with, with public housing? Okay. So public housing, we're seeing almost a 20% reduction in, um, in blood lead levels. Housing choice vouchers, not as much. Still in the right direction. Samples are getting a little small. So I, it, I, I'm not sure I want to overinterpret this to say that there's no effect, um, but it, it, it's certainly not as pronounced. Multifamily housing in, right there in the middle still a significant reduction in, in blood lead compared to those um, on the wait list. And, and you're just taking a look at, uh, at predicted blood lead levels for, for these groups. We're actually seeing that public housing and multifamily housing are reducing blood lead levels below what you see for, for housing choice vouchers. So it's not just that folks are doing really, really badly, then they get into public housing and they do a little less bad, they're doing better than, than the voucher group. Okay, now looking at um, odds of elevated blood lead, three and a half micrograms per, per deciliter or above by program, pretty consistent that there, there's a, a really large effect for public housing. Uh, the effect is in the right direction for vouchers, not significant, maybe, maybe not that, um, maybe not large enough to make anything of. Multifamily housing, the effect looks pretty large, just, you know, could be some statistical power issues here. Uh, I'm not sure I would wanna overinterpret it too much. Um, but generally, there's, there's the reduction that, that we expect. Okay, so just to summarize some, some findings here. The first is that housing assistance recipients experience a ton of economic and health disadvantage. You know, this, this is not my finding. This is well known from, from past research before I even started looking at any of this stuff. But I, I, kinda, I just want to reiterate it because it's really important to, to understand because sometimes we can mistake the, um, the relatively disadvantaged conditions of people receiving housing assistance for the effects of housing assistance itself. Uh, and so I think it's important to understand that this, these programs are serving a very disadvantaged population, maybe the most disadvantaged one to 3% of Americans. Um, and so it's not surprising that we're seeing a lot of, um, a, a lot of disadvantage across these dimensions. But I, we should not attribute that to the effects of the programs. Because I'm finding that access to housing assistance reduces blood lead. Um, and especially it reduces the risk of experiencing elevated blood lead across the, the age span. And interestingly enough, the effects are strongest for public housing. The public housing is really doing most of the work here in terms of reducing blood lead. The, the effect is non-significant for, for housing choice vouchers. So what are the implications? And returning to this question, how bad is public housing? As I said before, you, you could be forgiven for having the impression that public housing is uniquely bad that it's in poor, poor condition, there's been no maintenance, people are having to, to live in lead-infested places when they could be living um, in better housing. And I think that one thing to come out of this, right, is that public housing is good. Public housing is actually reducing people's exposure to lead, it's reducing their risk of elevated blood lead levels. And so I, I think despite the conventional narrative, you know, that public housing is bad, 
and it's an indictment of big government in general, and if we just gave people money, the, all these problems would go away. Um, I think that it's important to uh, recognize that residents actually do enjoy better housing quality than they did before they, they entered. Um, and so I don't want to confuse this with the idea that public housing is the best housing out there. Maybe it should be. That, that would be an amazing policy goal. But I, that, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's better than people who are using it would expect in the absence of public housing. And then an another implication is that quality still matters, right? So, so much of housing research now is focused on affordability, the affordable housing crisis, and especially since the, the Great Recession, that, that's really dominated the conversation in terms of uh, housing and health. Uh, but quality is still really important. Um, and if you were to Google um, something like public housing is better quality than the alternative, it turns up zero results. Although, unfortunately, I, I did try this with a few other things, and like almost anything that specific turns up zero results. Uh, so some, some other people are talking about this, I think. It's not just me. OK, and then tying this back to how we think about the social determinants of health, and that's that your lead exposure depends a lot on your access to safe and stable housing. Um, that you, it, that you're, what your blood lead level turns out to be is not just your own behavior. It's not you doing bad things with lead. It's not you not watching your kids. It's not all the things that you know, people are often told about what will um, keep their kids from, from having elevated blood lead. A lot of it actually depends on your access to, to safe and stable housing. And as a result, because safe and stable housing is something that is inequitably um, applied in the United States, it's a, an important mechanism linking economic inequality to, to health disparities. Um, now, there are lots of them, right? So economic inequality is linked to health disparities through a ton of different mechanisms, and lead exposure through your housing is, is one. But this also ties back to our investment as, you know, as, as a society in, in affordable, stable, safe, and stable housing, right? So and this, this ties back to the wait list. That the wait list exists because we have inadequately invested in this public good. Um, in, in these housing programs that there is evidence improves people's health. Um, and so what this means, right, so if we're going to take this to its logical conclusion, is that there are millions of people who still experience elevated blood lead because we haven't adequately invested in it. And so I, I want to end with kind of a, some thoughts about racism and, and public policy broadly, and then tying that into the housing assistance. It, it, is, it is only tangentially related to lead, but it, it's, it's heavily related to a lot of the other work that I've done on, um, on housing assistance. And, and that's that housing assistance is unique among US programs for a few reasons. Um, one is that it's unique for how much it disproportionately serves black families. Um, so if we look at other, other safety net programs like SNAP, Medicaid, WIC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, um, the participants are disproportionately non-Hispanic black relative to, um, to the, uh, the black population in the United States. But HUD housing assistance is on another level, right? So 45% of participants are non-Hispanic black, 20 to 25% of other safety net programs are, are non-Hispanic black. So, so this, this program is very heavily disproportionately serving black families. But it's also unique among these programs for how difficult it is to access, right? So th this is now the typical wait time to get access to these programs if you're living in Minnesota. Um, SNAP, you wait about 30 days to have your application processed. Medicaid can take up to 45 days if things really go wrong, but usually it's a lot faster than that. Uh, WIC is automatic if you're already receiving SNAP, um, then, then there's really the paperwork kind of transfers over. Earned income tax credit exists through the taxation system, so there's not really a wait time. It just is, is sort of automatic as long as you use it. HUD housing assistance, two years. right? And this, this is a huge difference. And, and I think what I would end on here is that these, these two characteristics of housing assistance programs in the United States are not coincidental, right? That it is because housing assistance disproportionately serves black families that it is also the most difficult to get access to, um, specifically because the constituency for it 
largely is is opposed to um, providing uh, help and assistance to to black families. So I'll, I'll end there. Um, thank you all again for for coming, and I put up some pictures here of America's greatest city. Hi, thank you. Fascinating. So I can't help um, telling a story. I'm June Carbone from the law school. And in 1982, I represented HUD, which was trying to fight congressional efforts to mandate the elimination of lead-based paint in public housing. Uh, not simply to say no new lead-based paint, but you've got to remove all the existing lead-based paint. And I uh, remember it vividly because I was eight months pregnant, and I'm sure that's why I was assigned to the case. And everyone in the office thought it was a complete loser legally, and we lost. But <laughs> that gets to my question. Do you have accountability? for taking action to remove lead, say, in public housing that you don't have in, say, voucher assistance programs or decentralized. I mean, my rule of thumb as somebody who teaches property is that landlord-tenant market is among the most decentralized in the country when it comes to markets, and therefore harder, harder to please get information uh, and implement any kind of a mandate, whereas Public housing and the government, you, there, you, there are people you can make accountable, my clients. Yes, uh, that, is, that is a great point. So um, the idea being that if to the extent that there are differences between public housing and housing choice vouchers, some of that could be due to who is actually accountable to um, public grievance, right? And housing authorities, because of their nature as public entities, can kind of have to listen, right? And there, there's one entity, and they're responsible for administering thousands of units. Um, and partially because they serve a very low income constituency, they're often, they're, they're often a, um, an opponent for a lot of people who want to make a point about how well the government does at administering services. So they, they, act, they take a lot, of, um, a lot of flack from people for different reasons. Private landlords don't don't have that issue, right? So you, you can't sue the, the 7,000 private landlords who participate in the Housing Choice Voucher Program unless you want there to be zero landlords participating next year, right? And, and that, I mean, that, that could be what's going on. I, I don't want to necessarily say that absolutely because public housing is run by the government and we get mad at the government for various things and they have to listen because we, we elect people or we elect people who appoint people um, but, but that certainly could be part of what's going on. But I, but I also want to say that some, sometimes people criticize housing authorities for the wrong reasons. Because, because they don't like the idea that the government is administering services generally, and this is a nice low-hanging fruit that lots of people don't like. Uh, we have a question online from Kathy Allers. Um, so her question is sort of related. Uh, the question is, so is your assumption that the main signal in the data is because public housing complexes were mostly built in the 1960s or more recently, as have the multifamily housing complexes generally, and that the effects are related less to less use of lead paint um, versus older housing, which tends to be lower rent costs, poor condition housing, and contain lead paint? And then in addition to that, so would other new construction single family homes, uh, for example, a new Habitat for Humanity home, in theory, provide just as much protection against lead exposure as a multifamily public housing? Okay, so there, there's a lot of questions contained within that, but there, there's one, one piece that comes through that I think is, is reasonable, and that's, is the age of public housing build, buildings related to to lead exposure. And yes, but not in the direction we might expect. So if we look just kind of at, is there expected to be lead paint in, in this building or not, public housing actually looks worse than, than private housing uh, because lots of it was constructed before lead paint was banned. Um, I mean, there was a moratorium on public housing construction in the 1970s and very little has been built since then. Um, some, I mean, I showed you some examples of, of what's been built since then, but a, a lot of public housing predates this. 
And so in theory, right, there, there is lead paint in public housing more so than in a lot of private housing. Um, and so all else being equal, right, if we could shift funds from public housing developments to Habitat for Humanity, that, that would be good in terms of lead paint. Um, I'm skeptical that we would be able to build those houses publicly for less than about a million dollars per unit, um, which maybe is the, the point, right, to say that it's too expensive, so now we can't do anything, throw our hands up and say, well, it's only, it's only poor people that are suffering, so let's, let's turn our focus to, to other programs. Um, but I, I mean, I think it, it is that there are some structural characteristics of, of public housing developments that would be expected to be related to, to lead paint. I just don't think it's the age. I think more of it has to do with uh, how often they're inspected and how often their um, issues related to lead have to be fixed. Just curious, do we have any insight on what the living situation of those who are on the wait list is? And what, you know, where they got to, to, to public housing and do we have a notion of where they're coming from? Yes, great question. And, and the unfortunate thing is not really. Uh, so it, at least, so not from the survey, right? So the, the survey itself um, has very little information about the characteristics of one's housing. I mean, the most they have is like the number of rooms and things, um, but we, we, yeah, we don't know anything kind of about the quality of people's housing on the wait list. Um, the assumption one could make is that it's, it's actually, it's poor, right, or, or relatively poor um, compared to, to what people are experiencing in, in housing assistance. Um, some colleagues and I have a project in, in New Haven that um, started with interviewing people who are on the wait list, and then we're going to follow them into, into housing as they get access off the wait list. Um, and the baseline data from that demonstrates that people's housing situation um, is pretty poor along a lot of dimensions, right? So quality is one, but also in terms of stability and affordability and where exactly they're expecting to live from day to day, like that, all those things sort of compound. So, so that well, I mean, quality is a piece, but there's also these other, these other issues. And if people are waiting for years then. Yeah, that, that, that's a piece. I mean, it, it's not the majority by any means. Hey, this is great. Thank you. I was wondering if there is any um, seasonality signal and the specific reason I'm asking. I mean, I know that lead poisoning often is seasonal, but I, I was wondering if it um, can tell us anything about whether the home-based sources of exposure are like paint and water within the home versus like being next to freeways that had leaded gasoline for a long time or being next to Smith Foundry if you're in Minneapolis and living in Little Earth or what have you? Uh, so good question, whether there's seasonality in, in the lead data. I have no idea. Um, yeah, never even thought about it, but but my my guess would be it would be tough to pick up that noise since the lead levels are relatively low as, as they are. Um, and it would of course, be hard to disentangle things like how near you are to a freeway to from other aspects of of your housing. Um, but yeah, it, it brings up an important point that we don't actually know what the individual sources of lead are for people in the survey, right? So we know that we know they're measured blood lead. We don't know if it's because their water pipes are lead. We don't know if it's because there's lead dust on the window sills of their house. We don't know if it's because there's construction in their neighborhood and so they're breathing in the the air from the, the paint. I mean, it, it's like uh, lots of these things, but we don't know. And, um, and I'm not sure that there's a good way to find out. I had just a descriptive, but kind of big picture question on that slide where you had the, um, the wait time for the different um, types of assistance. I mean, what's different about housing, you've kind of just got at this with one of your earlier answers, but you have to build it, right? You can't just decide to allocate your money differently, at least if you're doing like actual programs and not kind of the voucher, I mean, like actual housing facilities and not the voucher. And so that made me wonder just of these various programs, what is the scale of spending on them and how does HUD look compared to some of these other programs? And what, you know, for the people who are, with some of these other programs, I feel like I have a sense of, 
the folks on the ground, what they're fighting for today in terms of like, what would it look like, for instance, to get Medicaid for all, for instance. But with housing, I don't know that I have a same sense of like, what would be the big vision here to fight for, given that you have to build it if we need more housing, and given all of the complexities and the expense of building new housing and where people want to live. Anyways, how do you think about the big picture of like what we do with all this? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, this, so this, this question, I, I've been thinking like, how, how do we expand housing to where it, where it should be in terms of a public program? Um, I've been thinking about this for a while, and, but it just made it kind of to like public discussion during the Biden administration, like a actually making housing, housing assistance similar to these other programs to be an entitlement was actually in Build Back Better and, and that failed or in, it was taken out before it failed. Um, but, but I mean, there's actually a blueprint for how to do this, right? So you don't, you don't have to build the housing now. The Housing Choice Voucher Program, in theory, right, can be expanded to, to anybody who qualifies tomorrow with, with enough money. Now, there are, of course, issues with the affordable housing crisis in general. Like, there just are not enough units and not enough landlords willing to participate that probably a, a true expansion of housing assistance to where it should be involves a lot of construction. Um, and, and there are difficulties with that because it's extremely expensive to, to publicly build housing these days. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think it, it's not outside the realm of possibility because, so I, HUD housing assistance is about $40 billion annually, um, which is substantially less than we spend on, um, on these other programs. It serves far fewer people uh, than, than the other programs. And, but the, the actual kind of, if you could put into a dollar amount, the benefit people are getting, it's pretty substantial. It's like a 70% increase in their income. Yeah, this has been really great. Um, I actually have two questions for you. Why, do, why is vouchers having the least effect? I would have thought it'd be the other way around because people can choose where they live. And the second question is, I was wondering if there's any regional bias. And the question I'm actually getting at behind this is that the public housing in different places is probably built at different times in different ways. And it's a way of trying to get at what housing is quote, better. Yes, OK. So the first is, why, why are vouchers not doing their job? Um, and, and I don't know specifically. I can speculate a little bit. Um, and you know, HUD. HUD, I think, is a little disappointed about these sorts of outcomes because a lot of their programmatic focus over the past 30 years has been on expanding vouchers and reducing public housing's um, base on the program, uh, specifically for the reason you mentioned. And because in theory, right, people can use the voucher to live wherever they want. Um, in practice, that's quite difficult because the generosity of your voucher only goes up to a certain level in the market. Depending on where you live, it could be either about the 40th percentile in, in your county or in your housing market. In some cases, the, it's the 40th percentile in your neighborhood or in your zip code. Um, but in a lot of cases, that, that just is not sufficient to be able to afford a unit when you have to convince a private landlord to participate in a government program that has all these other stipulations. Um, that it's much easier to induce landlords to participate if vouchers are forming a large fraction of the housing market. And in many high income neighborhoods with nice housing, there, there just is not enough of a, a voucher component. Um, and the second question, uh, uh, variability across regions. Um, so, Yes, there is variability across regions. Um, we don't have enough people in, in the sample to actually look at differences in the effect. Although I will say that blood lead levels are higher in the Northeast than in other parts of the US. Whether that exists also uh, in public housing or whether public housing is more effective in the Northeast because people's kind of background blood lead is higher, I don't, I don't know. We, we, don't really have, we don't have enough people to, to say. There, um, like we're we're digging as far as we can in, into this data. Thanks, Andy. That was fascinating. Uh, my question is: Do you think there's anything unique, or is 
about lead in particular in relation to other aspects of housing quality. So if you were to look at other aspects of housing quality for public housing, would you have similar findings? And I'm not quite sure what those other aspects would be if that's like heating or I don't know what, but. Good question. Uh, so I, I do think that lead is unique in that it's it's a really important signal indicator for a fair number of housing quality concerns and like maybe how how they're directly affecting people's health in both the short and long term. Um, but excuse me. But I don't think that there's actually anything unique about it if we were to look at say um, ventilation, right, or or heat loss or something like that. That's not necessarily related to to lead. I think it'd be better in public housing. And in the wait list. All right. Thank you so much, Andy. This was great. And thanks for all of you for coming. We'll see you next week.